Okay. So this is the Wednesday night, Well of Being. I'm Eve, your teacher, and what I hope to be your companion and guide through, as, through this text that we're making our way through a bit slowly. Um, someone who I um, know dearly, who I went through this book with, I think back in 2013, was asking me, how long do you think that book will take? And probably like as long as it needs to. Um, when we did Old Path, White Clouds, which is like, that was a huge book. I, I think it was a year, maybe? Yeah, yeah, but when you're having fun, who notices? Time just flies. Um, this is an eighth century text by Shanti Deva, and he was, you know, a, um, I love his biography because everybody thought he was not really paying attention at Nalanda which is the institute where he was learning and receiving teachings. He was many, one of the many princes of that time who decided to let go of the princely luxuries and responsibilities and seek the spiritual path. And his, his friends and colleagues at the monastery decided a really good way to help him get serious would be to offer him, why don't you come and give a teaching to us? And they were all kind of snickering in the background, thinking that he would totally blow it. Uh, and he goes up there and offers what is still one of the most famous and beloved texts, this guide to the Bodhisattva way of life. And then kind of uh, according to the stories, you know, completely disappears. Um, so it's, it's a good text, uh, some good jewels. And you'll definitely hear many Buddhist teachers reference it. His Holiness the Dalai Lama says that it's one of his closest texts that he keeps near his heart. And I think the reason people love this text so much is it really emphasizes kind of the skills and tools and philosophy of how to approach life with a completely open heart and this life that is full of suffering. So how do we become a warrior of compassion? How are we able to have that heart open and feel like we have kind of forged this inner strength? And also, how can we see clearly enough to actually recognize that there is suffering all around us and not be quite so caught up in our own difficulties and challenges? So that's kind of the twofold approach of this uh, text. And yeah, who here is feeling a little tenderhearted about the world these yeah. days? Yeah, it's, and I think if you're not, there's probably something, um, you know, yeah. you're, yeah, a little wrong, <laughs> yes, or some, or a way that you're distracting yourself or denying or avoiding that, that will catch up. And it's really beautiful to have this text where it's kind of um, calling us to task, like what is needed? Come on in. I think, is there one chair? Yeah, there. Yes, you got it. No worries, no rush. Um, you know, I think that the calling us to task, especially that's happening in this chapter of taming the mind, it's a calling us to task that we absolutely need to learn how to have a mindfulness practice in which our mind feels hmm, that kind of, I loved the words in the last chapter, this kind of very poignant awareness of what's going on, as though you were walking next to a cliff. Like that level of, I'm so aware right now, because if there's a false step, I will fall in. And in this chapter, um, we've been going over the many different ways that the wild elephant of the mind can kind of trample um, over our better intentions and even over the very sources of our own happiness. Last week, there was a little divergence. This is a, a, a book that has nine chapters, but Pema Chodron, who does the secondary commentary, decided not to include the ninth chapter in this book because the ninth chapter is all about emptiness. And that can be a complicated subject. However, in addition to this training of the mind, allowing ourselves to come back over and over and over with the kind of rope of mindfulness, tethering that elephant of the mind, the other way that we can really experience kind of the spaciousness needed to enact and embody the compassion for the world is this non-dual spacious awareness. So last week we did a little practice with that and visiting that and I will find a translation of the ninth chapter for us when we get there. 
um, complicated though it may be. But this week we're going to come back to, yeah, really the simple hard work of shamatha, of attention practice. And I often bring up the name Alan Wallace, who was my kind of first teacher and is a shamatha enthusiast at the least, maybe a proselytizer. Uh, he really thinks that it is so essential we learn this capacity to bring our mind back over and over to develop, sustain, and then maintain single pointed attention. And so tonight we're going to practice with a, a beautiful practice, one that he loves from Asanga, which is called stillness and motion. And there's many ways to do this practice. The stillness is our awareness. The motion could be our thoughts, it could be the breath, it could be watching how other phenomena are always moving through. And I don't know if anybody saw that moon on the way in. It's just like, if you can even visually hold an image of the moon, it encompasses the stillness and the luminosity of our awareness. And I know, and, and sometimes we talk about here, words are so tricky, you know, like luminosity, stillness, emptiness. But when you have something, just that palpable sense that we get in, um, kind of reflecting on this beautiful quality in the natural world of moon, it's like, ah, that stillness. And the movement might be clouds going by it, right? Something moving past it. And the main point of this practice of shamatha is to really notice the fluctuations of breath. We're not gonna change them or alter them. We're not gonna make them faster or slower. Just noticing that the body in its own wisdom is often changing the subtle rhythm of our breath all on its own. So we're kind of resting in the stillness of awareness while we're observing the movement of breath and the subtle changes. And we're gonna add on one piece. Um, some of you are very familiar with this term contemplative science. We actually have a couple contemplative scientists in the room tonight, pretty exciting. And this term, which has been used for the, the, the study, you know, neuroscience, social psychology, um, other disciplines of consciousness and mind, compassion, it actually came from a writing of Alan Wallace, who said that a contemplative science is when we apply first person introspection to our experience. And that means instead of let's, you know, um, hook you up to a bunch of different monitors and assess what's going on for you and how you are. Instead, let's ask you, what is the quality of your mind right now? What is your heart like right now? And that the practice, many of the practices um, in traditional Buddhism and, and many wisdom traditions across the world is developing <laughs> us to become first person scientists of our own experience, of our own mind. And Tonight, one of the main instructions with shamatha is noticing when we become distracted and noticing when we become grasping and noticing when we become dull. So that's a first person introspection. And so I'll, you know, we'll be doing very simple practice, breath awareness, you know, having a little bit of the grounding with the stillness to notice the motion. And then every now and then, I will be prompting us to apply this first person introspection. How is my practice right now? Is my mind distracted by something? Is it grasping onto something? Has it fallen into dullness? Mm -hmm. And we don't stay there with a kind of litany of, God, what's wrong with you? Why can't you focus for even 30 seconds? Um, not that kind of <clears throat> you know, noticing, just a, a brief noticing so that we can return. But developing this first person introspection, it's so useful. And most of us do it in our practice naturally, especially if we've been practicing for a while. We recognize, oh, I've really fallen into dullness. Okay, I'm gonna come back to my anchor, come and notice my breath. And we may notice we're distracted only when like somebody coughs in the room. We're like, wow, I've been thinking about the weekend for <laughs> probably the last five minutes, right? We come back. And so we're just kind of applying this a little bit more deliberately. Um, one of the, uh, 
yeah, this is one of, you know, the ways that Shantideva is beseeching us to train our mind in this way. He says, all you who would protect your minds, maintain awareness and your mental vigilance, guard them both at cost of life and limb. Thus, I join my hands beseeching you. Um, he said, let my property and honor all grow less and likewise my health and livelihood, even other virtues, they can all go. I will never disregard my mind. And you know, his emphasis is on this because we recognize that no matter what is going on for us, you know, whether there is a terrifying election, right? Whether we're experiencing back pain, whether we're really tuned in to many of the places of suffering in the world, with this ability to train and tame and maintain the mind, we can find freedom. And that freedom allows us to be available with our compassion for others. And every single time, always with these practices, we're coming back to that that aspiration, that bodhicitta, how can I be more of service to others? Um, and as I, I often share, but it's worth sharing again, that is absolutely your most reliable uh, activity towards your own happiness as well. It's not just, I should do that. That's a nice thing to do for people. Like, if you wanna be happy, practice compassion. And obviously, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. And so the bodhisattva path it really inspires us to do this inner work, but having that really clear frame of why, for whom? Because it motivates us, like we do it more, um, and then it helps us re recognize and become more aware of what is the benefit, what is the purpose of having this mind that feels more pliable. So with that preamble, find a comfortable position for practice. We'll practice for about, 20, maybe 30 minutes, I'll be guiding you. And then after we will have discussion, talk a little bit more about the text here. And for folks, especially if it's your first time, maybe just getting a sense of this room, like looking around in a non-creepy way, you know, <laughs> recognizing there's other beings here. We've got Coco in the mix. And we've got Mace at the door who really helps keep us protected here so we can practice. And yeah, recognizing that being able to practice in community with each other is an unbelievable gift and something that each person here is offering. So I just really appreciate and thank all of you for being here and offering your presence. And now let's, let's find a posture and, and take a couple moments, you know, I've, for me, I, I feel like my, my leading edge in practice right now is letting the posture naturally arise for, in practice. And I've been finding that it has really this quality of showing me how to practice well. So there's these classic instructions, these seven points we pay attention to, but at a simple level, really noticing and feeling it's the kind of wholesomeness and goodness of our spine when it's upright. We could almost feel and imagine that there was a, a single thread pulling the crown of our head upwards. And we find just the slightest tucking of the chin. And the eyes can be open and softly gazing if that feels comfortable and brings in vividness. Or the eyes can be closed. And softening through the face, softening through the heart, softening through the belly. And finding a place where the hands can rest easily on the lap. That could be palms facing down on the thighs or folded in the lap. And before I ring the bell, taking a couple more moments to really feel into this posture. The meditation posture is, is a posture of our dignity 
our choice to be here and doing something that is valuable and meaningful. So we could think of sitting in our posture almost as th sitting on a throne, that level of importance and value. And for a couple moments as we settle in, allowing all your sense portals to be softly open. So noticing sounds or noticing sensations in the body. Maybe even if there is some sort of scent. Just allowing yourself in this sensory way to more fully arrive in this unfolding present moment. To prepare us for practice, we'll settle the body, speech, and mind in their natural states. Settling the body into a state of stillness. Even as we experience the subtle energies and breath moving in the body, we allow ourselves to feel the quality of stillness. Moment by moment, breath by breath, that stillness deepens. And to help settle the inner speech and to its natural state, we can gently follow the breath as a way to connect with inner silence. Of course, there are still thoughts and memories and images, but this focusing on the breath, settling the speech into a state of silence, invites us to really rest in the gaps between these thoughts, memories, and images. Breathing in, really entering the breath fully with our attention and awareness. And breathing out extending our attention and awareness with the breath.
while still deepening the sense of stillness in the body and connecting to some inner silence through following the breath. We allow the mind to also find its natural state, warmth, openness. Almost as though we are leaning back in the mind. Just like that beautiful moon, recognizing this natural state of mind, not only as open and warm, but that lunar-like quality of brightness. This natural state of mind, a spacious awareness, has just a natural warmth to it. So seeing if we can sense that if we have glimpses of this natural state of mind as warm and open, that there's a welcoming quality. An intrinsic ease Feel or imagine that this natural state of mind resting in this natural settled speech of silence, body of stillness. And we could experience the entire mind and awareness with this quality of stillness, openness. And as we shift into our shamatha practice, we find the movement of breath as our stable, steady, single-pointed focus. This gentle movement of the breath within this greater awareness, stillness, of our awareness. Invite yourself to fully give yourself to the practice of following the breath. 
noticing the subtle shifts and changes breath to breath. The breath might be a little deeper or more shallow. The breath might feel stronger, weaker. And the real subtlety of paying this close attention without becoming tight. Just brightening our attention single pointedly, focusing on the breath. in order for the mind to have that precise, clear, single-pointed attention and not become rigid. We want to continue feeling a sense of ease in the body, a deep existential relaxation of the body with this brightening and vividness of mind. Applying our first person introspection. Is the mind distracted? Is it grasping? Has it succumbed to dullness? And with great kindness and maybe even rejoicing, coming back to the simple task, following the breath, brightly with the body so deeply at ease, mind can find such refuge in staying with this single task. We may notice a pleasantness of just sustaining breath by breath, single pointed, precise, clear attention.
once again, checking in. Is the mind distracted, dull, grasping? Maybe we decide we need to brighten a bit further, focusing on the inhale. Or maybe we need to relax a bit with the exhale in the body. If we're distracted, we may need that relaxation. If we're dull, we may need the brightness. And in this way, learning how to attend closely to our own experience, develop this deep knowing of when we fall away from attention. And swiftly returning. For most of us, shamatha is not easy. And so we keep the encouragement that every single breath can be a full cycle of meditation. Breath by breath, we train ourselves to come back. Breath by breath, we start tethering the mind. It is actually the returning that is the deepest part of the training. So re-energizing our inspiration and dedication. Let's continue following the breath just as it is. Noticing the subtle shifts and changes. With full commitment of our attention.
without expectation, but with an invitation. Notice, is there anything pleasant about simply following the breath? An ease, a tranquility. One last time, applying introspection. Is the mind dull, distracted? Is it grasping? Maybe find a remedy, focusing with vividness on the inhale, relaxation in the body through the exhale, maybe both. giving ourselves one more chance to deepen, to fully enter the single pointed focus on the breath. When the bell rings, before fully coming back to this room in our shared space, take a moment and really notice what it feels like in the mind, heart, and body. How this practice might have shifted or changed the experience of being here. Thank you for your practice. So here at the Dharma Collective, we have the good fortune of being a community that constellates in a slightly different way every week. And that gives us the unique opportunity 
every week to consider what does it mean to be in community with one another, to be in community in the context of compassion. And one of the most beautiful things that I love about um, this Sangha and community is there is a, an openness and transparency of heart and folks share about their practice and their questions. And in order for us to do so well, we really have to engage in mindful listening and mindful speech to use the practice of meditation, not only here on the cushion, but the practice of meditation in terms of how we orient to one another as community and as Sangha. So that's my invitation for folks here. And, you know, it's really important as our community um, gathers that if there are things the center can do to more support a sense of openness and care that we do so. Um, I used to say this more often, but it'd be great if folks have ideas and suggestions. They're welcome to share them with me or any of the volunteers or write them, send an email. Um, yeah, I just so appreciate our community here and want us all to, yeah, feel that openness and ability to, to share and listen with one another. So number one principle is non-harming, which seems like a low bar, but when you think about <laughs> negative self-judgment, that's included. So be very kind and gentle with yourself here in our conversation and in our reflections. Um, and with that, any questions or reflections on that practice on just going hard with shamatha, which is for many people, their primary practice all the time. Um, we usually use it as a jumping off here in this community. So curious what folks noticed or any questions they had from that practice. Yes, please. Oh, and sorry, we use a mic. It's not okay. amplified, but for friends at home. Um, cool. Uh, I felt like a deep sense of relief. Um, mm -hmm. And I have ADHD. And it's, so it's like my mind is always going about a million miles an hour. Yeah. Um, and this space in this container that you all have here is like yeah. really powerful. And so mm -hmm. being here like in amongst all of you practicing, it like gave me the discipline and the accountability that I needed um, and really help me totally relax into it. So it was yeah. a transformative experience. Aw, thanks, Drew. That's great to hear. Yeah, and welcome. And it is, you know, it's, I was um, chatting with, with someone yesterday about this, this kind of quality that we don't often measure in, in research around meditation, which is being with other people can actually help us emotionally regulate to, in order to feel connected and soothed so that our mind can relax. However, mirror on other people can do quite the opposite. <laughs> There's no guarantee of that, right? And it could even be like, you know, day to day that could change with our own friends and family and roommates and whatever. But there is really, um, I think part of the reason that Sangha is so powerful is that we are mammals, right? And there is this kind of quality of together that helps us be like, oh, that part's okay. Now I can do this other thing that might be a little more challenging, so. Thanks for pointing that out. Is there a hand online? Claudia. Hi, Claudia. Hi, how are Hi. you doing? I'm good. Nice to see you. Likewise. Well, I have a comment and also a question. Um, I, well, first, let me, let me just say, I'm reading a, a great book called um, Hallelujah Anyway by Anne Lamott. Mm. And in one of the chapters, she says, obviously, she's, at, she's got explored different um, philosophies or religions. And she says, when dropping down, we rise to the higher tiers of our existence, mm. into higher realms of awareness, just humanly being. Um, and then she says, deep is the realm of soul. And I tot it totally resonated with me because when I've done these practices, um, and I managed to silence my mind and go beyond, I experienced tremendous joy. And mm. you're right when you were talking about how, you know, we feel this freedom, this expansiveness. And then I oftentimes, when I finish that practice, I, 
which is usually in the morning, you know, I, I, I get up because I usually do it lying down and I have a big smile. I, I mean, I'm, mm. it's, it brings so much joy to me. And yes, I'm definitely much more open, um, yeah. you know, but my question is, um, what would you were talking about focusing on the breath? And I did notice that I was getting distracted several times. So I would bring myself back to the breath, you know. But I was wondering what would it feel like to grasp? I didn't quite mm. get that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the dullness I can see, the distraction I can see, but the grasping. Can you elaborate a little bit more on yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to say, um, first, on your reflection of feeling the joy in practice. Mm -hmm. It's good to know what we're attributing it to. Um, and so you were saying the practice brings me joy. And I, I think it's probably more accurate to say the practice helps you touch the joy that's already there. Oh, OK. Oh, right. You know, huh. nice. Because <laughs> I, I do think when, you know, a kind of a foundational and somewhat like important piece that we work on through these these practices over time is that we are always already good. Mm -hmm. You know, Buddha nature right. means that all of us are already good, which uh, work I'm working on, <laughs> right? And most of us, when we meet up with self-criticism, you know, we're that relentless factor of comparing or expecting or, you know, putting ourselves down in any way, we're really meeting the limits of our recognizing the intrinsic goodness. Mm -hmm. So whenever we can like touch the intrinsic goodness and practice to really recognize that's me. Nobody brought that to me, right? No one did that to me. That is me. It's like another layer of the practice itself. So thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. So, you know, the grasping is, it's interesting because like grasping and distraction have, there's something similar um, in them, and we could like elaborate them a little further, um, maybe next week as well. But with the grasping, it's often onto thoughts that are not always that pleasant, but feel mm. really juicy. Mm. <laughs> right? You know, like, um, yeah, what's going to happen in a couple weeks on the election, right? Mm. So that's a thought that might be really sticky, and that we really, even though it's not pleasant, in a kind of Vedana sense, really, um, whereas the distraction is kind of like you're just getting pulled here and there. You're not yeah. so tied in. Yeah. And then the dullness, of course, and there's even different levels of dullness. Um, there's the kind of torpor. Um, and then there's the, what's so interesting, I noticed, I think I shared this last week, you know, I was on retreat um, during that heat wave and none of us were sleeping so hot, no air conditioning. And we were practicing all day. And one thing that my teacher really um, kept reminding us is that wakefulness is not the same as tired. Hmm. And that there is a quality of inner wakefulness that actually is distinct from the physical body fatigue. And I, you know, I'm like such a baby. I'm like, oh, I don't sleep. I can't do anything. <laughs> and my friends who are parents are like, oh my God, <laughs> you need to stop. <laughs> like, you don't understand. <laughs> but, um, you know, on so little sleep, I mean, I was, un and, and the whole room, you know, 120 of us just focused on practice mm -hmm. because that's what we were there for. We had a great teacher and we, we, you know, we brought ourselves there. So it's interesting, yeah, to identify actually these different qualities of kind of dullness. And mm -hmm. many, you'll hear many writings and teachings on how dullness isn't just being tired it's actually a habit of mind that we get into mm -hmm. and for many of us the habit is when we relax it's right before we go to bed and we kind of associate meditation with this like relaxation but the kind of relaxation where we go dull mm -hmm. and it's really nice sometimes like sometimes dullness is really nice we're like ah like, it's like, you know like warm bath but there's none of that brightness mm -hmm that the that luminosity that moon like lunar quality um so that's how we know it's a little different and so it's interesting we can get into subtler and subtler levels of dullness 
Um, and I don't know if you all notice, it's really interesting to notice attention because like you can be focused on your breath like a lot, maybe 60%. And you're still thinking about like what treat you're going to have later after class. <laughs> Something slipped out the side door, you know? So you really get a sense of like, wow, there's so much capacity of this mind, you know, so much energy, so many ways for this energy to move through. And, you know, the way I really love thinking about it, what if I brought all of that back here for my wakefulness? You know, all that energy I'm donating to distractions and self-criticisms and comparisons and fantasies, that's all energy that is wakeful energy. You know, that could be just right here. That That's inspiring to me. Yeah. Any mm -hmm. other? Yeah. Thank you, Claudia. Nice to see you. Uh, when are you back? Are you back for Dia de los Muertos? Oh, Will we... oh I'm in San Francisco right now. Oh, okay. You're just yeah. cozy. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's not it. <laughs> But we're okay. not going to do the uh, we're not going to do the uh, the ceremony that we have done in the past at the park. Okay. Okay. We are. Yes. Oh, we the Dharma are. Collective? Yeah. 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 More soon at the end of our session tonight, we'll talk a little bit about our bigger plans. Great. But boy, Thank are there big plans? It's exciting. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Anybody? Yes, please. Um. Uh, there was a point when I was sitting and I uh, just sat a little bit more upright and yeah. um, yes. the, there was this, <laughs> there was this brightness yes. and it, it feels really resonant with like the brightness of the moon, mm. but the grasping, um, yeah. well, that quality is like, um, it's not bright like the moon. Oh, it feels um yeah erratic mm -hmm. um, yes yeah and i think like I, I posted something on social media and i was like i wonder how many likes i got <laughs> 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 and that feels like grasping yes um because i'm curious like yep. i, I want to look at my phone yeah. yeah and that bright it's not bright um it's right. not foggy either yeah but it is sticky. Mm -hmm. So I think the sticky, there's something interesting about that sticky quality, whereas the brightness feels very clean. Yes. Beautiful. And I think, you know, so good to have that kind of, yeah, it's, I don't know if it's exactly somatic, but like felt sense of those states, right? And so that clean quality, that more maybe still quality, and then the movement, right? And, you know, you can also, it's really interesting to notice the subtle difference, like thoughts have different velocities, sometimes it feels, you know, and different weights, and some of them will just move so quickly right through, and some of them are kind of taking their time, and it is, it is interesting, I've been really working, you know, in my first person introspection, my, my me search of my meditation experience of, can I feel that sense of the energy coming back? like I was describing, of re-gathering um, all the, that mental energy towards wakefulness, towards that kind of more lunar quality. I haven't been able exactly to kind of feel, you know, I, I want to imagine it like, you know, adding more, like a big bucket of water into a tub, like, there we go, more of my mental energy into this larger quantity. I don't feel it quite that way. Because when you are, when there is that bright experience, um, I don't know if you felt this, but it's very complete. It doesn't feel like anything's missing or needed. Um, but, or and, you know, then the thoughts come, take us away, which is not necessarily a problem. And I did mention this in the practice, and I know I've said this here many times, but it really is the coming back over and over develops this meta-awareness that allows us to, you know, move through the world in a more skillful way. So the training that we're doing here, it's not just enjoyable, which hopefully there are moments of enjoyment. It's also that that is the exact training that gives us the potential to recognize when we're about to get caught up in a difficult rumination, you know, or kind of other less skillful way of relating to others and ourself. So, thank you, Rosa. Yeah. Anyone else? Another hand online. Raf, what's up? 
Hello. You're cozy too. I am cozy. Um, I had a, a question about the breath. When I do shamatha, I often find myself initially listening to the breath or experiencing the breath. But once I get through the the not listening to the thoughts and grasping on all that, but then I find myself kind of doing the breath, experimenting with the breath, just playing with the breath, and I'm no longer listening to the breath. And I was wondering right. about that. Yeah, I was just kind of curious about that, that kind of balance of like I'm being with the breath, but not controlling it uh, versus the play of it and then figuring out how I'm reacting to the breath. And, and, and I just want to understand that a little bit better. Yeah. I think, and you know, um, I've gotten to know your playful mind in practice. And I think there is like this um, curiosity that can arise with the breath and almost immediately for, for all of us, when you start noticing the breath, there is a desire to kind of control it. You're like, oh, is it supposed to be like that? Well, that one seems really short. Maybe it's one should be longer, right? And there's kind of a, it can be like a little distracting, which is so ridiculous. It's like the simplest thing we never think about, right? And then here we are and it's like, wow, what's happening here? Like our mind is so eager to do anything <laughs> other than focus. Um, so I think we gotta be a little wary of that you know, other very common shamatha objects are like a stick, mm. a stone, the fire, right, um, of a candle flame. So it, it can be anything that we can give ourselves at that full single pointed attention. For me, I actually find um, focusing on the low belly to be the mm. best or most mm. successful sustaining. Um, candle flame is cool, but I it gets a little like you can get so deep in the absorption there that I think for me, it almost feels like I've lost the train of attention or shamatha. Um, but that's a whole other conversation on uh, jhana states versus shamatha that we won't have right now. But um, so I would say in your case, I would really um, be curious about the playful mind and also curious about what might be deepened by staying in the simplicity and maybe finding something super unplayful, like to have your focused attention and then see what happens. Um, yeah, cause I, I like suspect that. what's happening with the playful mind is I'm going, well, I think if I did box breathing, I'd be able to pay attention <laughs> even more to the box breathing and so yes. on. Yes, that's true. Yes. And, you know, now what's kind of labeled as breath work um, is like, Oh my God, an enormously effective set of different types of breathing practices. Um, and I think there is a lot of benefit. I mean, I, not, I think there is so much overwhelming research um, on the benefit of this. And I think, as I mentioned last week or maybe the week before, Tumo breathing, which comes from Tibetan Buddhism and is kind of the blueprint for a lot of Wim Hof techniques, enormously helpful because um, someone felt warm during practice last week. Was that? Yeah, right. And like that warmth that can be generated um, and the breath can really, you know, doing especially these more kind of heroic style breathing, which box breathing doesn't feel that heroic, just holding in and keeping and extending, but it is, um, it's more tangible and it is shamatha. It's not a classic way shamatha was taught. And my guess, um, I'd love to ask another colleague this too, but my guess is you know, you really want to get subtle with shamatha. And even the box breathing is a little um, kind of uh, exciting in a way. Like there's <laughs> there's more energy that's just created in that kind of pseudo hyperventilation state than just following the natural breath. And I think there's so much low and slow when we deepen into shamatha. So I think that's probably, um, yeah, probably why, but yeah, thank you. Okay, any other questions or thoughts before we get into ignorance? <laughs> Everybody's favorite topic. <laughs> Good, okay. Um, yeah, so then the next stanza here, 
Those disabled by ill health are helpless, powerless to act. The mind, when likewise cramped by ignorance, is impotent and cannot do its work. So here it's, um, you know, the, the stanzas just before were about how if you had a wounded limb, you would move very delicately through a crowd of unruly people. And in the same way, you know, with this wounded mind, this mind afflicted by distractions, by kleshas, by ignorance, you know, you kind of have to move, you know, in this different way with that kind of um, experience. And another analogy here, metaphor is creating, those who are disabled by ill health, who aren't able to act on their own, the mind when it's cramped by ignorance. And I really love the way, you know, ignorance is definitely a topic brought up in so many different parts of Buddhist teaching. And the way that we often think about ignorance, that word in, in kind of common language, has, um, has not a very great connotation. We really, I mean, the way I think about it is we associate it with people who are willfully and maybe in a, an intent of harming um, kind of, you know, this like hateful quality with ignorance. Is that how you guys associate kind of contempt, you know, ignorant people? Oh, they're just, they just want to hurt people or they're just harmful or they're, it's not the, the best um, phrase. And when he's describing the ignorance here, we're really talking about the ignorance of, of our separateness of really not knowing how fundamentally we belong to ourselves and to everyone. Um, this idea that there is a fundamental separation between who we are and who anyone else is, that's the kind of ignorance that really pollutes the mind. And not saying that we are all the same, like in the, some sort of you know um, blanket way, but this idea that Every single one of us wants to be happy and avoid suffering does make us all the same. And that that kind of knowledge shifts how we relate to the world, shifts how we relate to our experience moment to moment. So that's one of the ignorances that can kind of cramp our mind. Um, and Pema in her secondary text here says, um, <laughs> this illusion of subject and object, self and other, this ignorance is so ingrained, we take it for granted. But this misperception of separateness sets off an unfortunate chain reaction. It creates tension between you and me that leads to concepts of for and against, like and dislike, want and don't want. All of this creates our misery. And this generates a second kind of ignorance, the ignorance of kleshas. Once born, our emotions quickly intensify and suffering increases. Thus the ignorance of dualistic perception leads predictably to turmoil. Um, and I really love how she brings up the relationship of ignorance and kleshas. And so kleshas being you know, what is translated as defiled emotions, difficult or disturbing emotions. And as many of you know, I'm pretty pumped on emotions. And um, one thing it really brought to mind for me, you know, a kind of an essential teaching about understanding our emotions is recognizing that it's not just what's happening out there. It's not just like not enough people liked my post. Like, what the F, right? It's not just I feel lonely and I don't know what to do. There's like there's our own material that's happening, right? And in the Buddhist sense, you would call this the material of our karmic storehouse. It kind of been transmitted for uh, possibly many lifetimes. And in our, you know, here down on the ground, everyday contemporary science, we know this to be kind of the database of our emotion experiences throughout this life. Of course, deeply impacted by what happens early in our life, deeply impacted by what happens maybe repeated times in our life. And so this you know, database we think of as like a lens. And I, I understand why um, Pema would call this almost like an ignorance, right? Because if we're operating through the world out of our past stories, then we're reacting and creating these much bigger emotional events than needed because we don't see clearly. 
right? So that's that kind of interrelationship of the ignorance and the intensity of emotion. There's really nothing wrong with having an emotion, any emotion. What really gets us in trouble is when we react and we respond in ways that are harmful to ourselves and others. And usually that's, you know, has to do with our position about our rightness for feeling this way. So if we feel slightly sad that, you know, we only got seven likes or something, that's, a, that's not a lot. That would, that's okay. We're allowed to have the temporary sadness. But if the story is, no one ever likes what I do. I'm never going to do it right. We're kind of creating an extra layer to that natural experience of emotion that is, you know, kind of infused with an ignorance, not the ignorance because, um, you know, you've had difficulties in the past, but we're, we're seeing this momentary experience as the only experience. Someone told me this term today I loved, um, I'm an emotion permanency. When we feel the emotion will last forever in the moment. Right, and just that idea of oh, this sadness of um, not feeling cared about, not feeling supported, this is going to last forever. And also, you know, not seeing that yeah, everybody at some point has only gotten seven likes, no big deal. Right, this illusion of separateness inflames the difficulty of our emotions. Um, and so, it's not just that we need to you know, train the mind to come back over and over, like that's really important. But part of the reason we come back over and over, so we start to get more clear that lens of what we're seeing. So when we come back over and over, you know, and are attentive to the mind, we might realize when this kind of ignorance is arising, when it's inflaming our emotions, when we're having a much bigger reaction that is actually called for in the moment. Um, and she says here, just as ill health incapacitates the body, ignorance covers the freshness of our pristine naked mind. The inability to see without bias and preconception clouds our natural mindfulness and alertness. Without a clear, stable mind, we live a fear-based life, so controlled by our emotions, we don't really know what's going on. Just as physical therapy can restore the body to basic health, Shamatha meditation is mental therapy that can restore our basic sanity. So I really, I, I, I mean, we need that. <laughs> Not just us here in this room, mind you. <laughs> All of us need that. And this idea that, you know, the simple practice of coming back to the breath. And there has been, you know, so much research. I might have mentioned last week, I can't remember, there was a, a three month study of Shamatha that's called the Shamatha Project. And a um, friend and colleague, Cliff Sarin, has published, I don't know, like 17 papers on this, Philippe, something like that. And he still has terabytes of data. Um, so he, you know, took every measure possible of people practicing in a retreat of Shamatha for three months and was just so curious what that level of attention would, would help us with. And one of my favorite papers out of those 17, everything from like your improved reading retention, like you're able to hold information better. But the one that I love is around emotion reactivity. And so the people in the beginning um, of the study, they watched difficult to watch film clips, right? So this might, I think it was soldiers talking about um, how difficult it was in different war zones, right? When they had killed someone or when someone they loved had been killed, it was pretty heavy duty. And then they did, they filmed um, and tracked and monitored the people after the three months of practice. And they had a control group and compared them. And what you saw the difference was, wasn't in facial expression. In both cases, they showed sadness. And when you asked them, is this sad? In both cases, they said it was sad but the physiological arousal in the body. After three months of that attention practice, they weren't so distressed by this sadness. And indeed, in both cases, they endorsed compassion. They said, I care, this matters. But isn't this what we all want? I see Mace making eye contact here. Isn't this what we all want? Still caring, right? But without it affecting our bodies so deeply. Because in some ways that that distress, you know, is like that self-related concern. I, I can't, so much, I can't handle it. 
And what you see also um, in this naturalistic observation of people's emotions is there's a reduction in anger in talking about this, because some people get angry, like, I can't believe the military asked people to do this, and da, da. so reduction in anger and contempt. Um, so it's really interesting what this sustained, focused attention, you know, how it impacts not only our ability to hopefully have that basic mental sanity, but also maybe our ability to regulate and be with our emotions. Yes, Kimberly. Is there no. Increase. increase yeah which is really nice but that makes sense because even though it was a so-called shamatha three-month retreat they were practicing the four measurables they were practicing compassion loving kindness because as i've mentioned before those are also shamatha practices if you're imagining somebody's face you know and their compassion that is a way to kind of focus your attention so yeah really beautiful um to see that and you know most of us are not going to do a three-month shamatha retreat some of us could but i think that doing it every day and you know I, I i'm as i think um some of you know like i'm so passionate about these practices in our everyday life right like of course it's wonderful to retreat and do that but these practices are transformative in our everyday life and I'm so appreciative of um, a colleague and friend who at the University of Wisconsin, he really did a rigorous study looking at many moments of awareness throughout the day as compared to kind of sustained, you know, half hour or hour or other kind of retreat and found that even these many moments of awareness are as beneficial and sometimes more beneficial than longer practice. So I feel like that should be encouraging of how we bring this into our everyday life. And of course, there were monastics in Tibet and um, Japan and China and everywhere that um, Buddhism was flourishing. There were huge lay communities of practitioners who, like us, had jobs if we were lucky, you know, had families if we're lucky, and are bringing the practice into life, not just into these more intensive, um, secluded from the world experiences. Yeah. Um, okay, and one more stanza here. And those who have no mental vigilance, though they may hear the teachings, ponder them or meditate, with minds like water seeping from a leaking jug, their learning will not settle in their memories. This is like pretty well evidenced when you look at memory research as well, you know? It's really hard for us to remember something we're not paying attention. Like, duh right but most of us are really distracted we're really distracted and you know we could blame technology but we've been distracted a long time it might be harder now um and so you know there were no um distracting devices when he was writing this scree he's really intense those who have no mental vig vigilance um with minds like water seeping from a leaking jug so just saying that unless we really can pay attention to what is being offered to us, whatever that teaching is, you know, there's so many natural teachings that arise throughout our life of these themes, right? So something like interdependence, recognizing we are not separate. That's, that's everywhere. That's all around us. We can see that like very clearly, you know, you can, you can see that. Um, I'm trying to think of a most recent time I've experienced it. It's just in the way that we not only engage with one another, but that like our, our world continues to rely upon, you know, the multiplicity of labor of many people for us to survive. Like there, the illusion of separateness is so thin and we can receive the teachings every day, but only if we're bringing mindfulness to everything. We're just kind of moving through. We're like, thanks for that, you know, thanks for the coffee and the salad, I'm out, right? With mindfulness potentially, you know, and with that not leaking jug of the mind, we could see like, wow, what is all the qualities and factors that contributed to this coffee and this salad? I recognize, you know, dependent origination in the clouds of this coffee, in the dirt of this coffee, you know, like that very kind of Thich Nhat Hanh beautiful approach, like recognize the clouds in your coffee, meaning it was clouds that there was water that, that allowed the coffee tree to be able to blossom and then hands that pick the coffee berries. And so we can kind of bring that attentiveness 
and to all of our life and these teachings become revealed as well. Um, and then the, the next stanza here, many have devotion, perseverance, are learned, also endowed with faith, but through the fault of lacking mental vigilance will not escape the downfall. And what Pema said here is that our, our, our kleshas, these difficult emotions and distractedness go together. Even with the excellent qualities of devotion or perseverance, the kleshas will continue to capture us. Unless our mind is present and relaxed, we'll find ourselves frequently worked up, which we know has unpleasant consequences. It's really interesting, this idea that distraction actually makes us more emotionally volatile. I haven't seen research on that. Maybe there is. But if we do the me search on that, like when we're distracted, are we more agitated, irritated, anxious? Yeah, probably, right? So there's, it's just interesting. And, you know, part of the approach, kind of part of the shtick that Shanti Deva has, is kind of really showing us, like, why would you not do this? Like, look at everything you're missing out on. You're distracted and unhappy, you know, like all of these different um, miseries of the mind, of the untrained mind. Like, oh, there's only one sane thing to do, train this mind. And it'll benefit everybody around you. So I think that's like his real emphasis here. So these two, I really, this, two, this little couplet is very emphatic in that. Lack of vigilance, so lack of mental vigilance, lack of mindfulness, is like a thief who slinks behind when mindfulness abates. And all the merit we have gathered and gathered in, he steals, and we go down into the lower realms. Mm -hmm. So this idea that, you know, even if we are doing practices that are of great benefit to others, with generating merit, even if we're offering that merit of our practice to others, when our mindfulness abates, you know, like a thief, uh, lack of vigilance will come. And defilements or these kleshas, these difficult emotions, are a band of robbers waiting for their chance to bring us injury. They steal our virtue when the moment comes and batter out the life of happy destinies. <laughs> it's very hardcore, you know, but when you think about metaphorically, what difficult and disturbing emotions do like it would we would look like we were bruised all over i think about that a lot if our anxiety showed up the way that it felt you know that would be wild you know you know like i think sometimes when i go surfing i'll like the board will hit me and there's a huge bruise everyone's like oh my god i'm like oh, i was surfing and you know like this big but what if like you were anxious and you like had all the bruises of just how painful that is and it was visible so it is kind of like i don't know if it's a band of robbers or thieves but the mind that lets itself get caught up especially in these difficult emotions um i love to share here because i hope and think it's relatable but that vulnerable time if we wake up at like three or four in the morning and we really experience these emotions and the and the consequence of them and it's so difficult, right? Because when we have anxiety at that time of night, our mindfulness is far away. Our dullness is very high, we're very tired. And that we really can feel like it's so hard to get out of this temporary mind state of whatever it is we think we're wrong, is wrong with our job, with our relationship, with the world. It becomes so dense and encompassing. You know, it's really hard for us to see the impermanence of it, see the ignorance of it, you know, like this, you know, there's no way that this emotion is actually the true and only thing. And without that vigilance of mind, our ability to say, just come back to the breath, just come back to the breath. It is, we, we lose a lot, it can be very painful. It doesn't have to be when we're asleep only, of course, we can have this during the day. But I think that's such a, a tender time any questions on the relationship of ignorance, kleshas, distraction? You have some homework to do, obviously, checking this out. But yes, Tom. Uh, 
I'm having one of these kind of psychological experiences that I have now and then, which is that during the breathing, during the shamatha practice, um, it felt like grasping was almost like a way to stay alive. It felt mm. like, you know, sort of what I would imagine that drowning would be like. And I have kind of particular experiences about that I can relate to about that, about why, you know, that it's sort of like that holding on to these thoughts, these yeah. fears or whatever is a way to sort of like continue to exist because yes. of the experiences that I had that yep. sort of went the other way. Yeah. And, um, you know, and part of it that I'm sort of just got a glimmer of was that like I felt like it's also a way that I'm kind of keeping my mother alive because she mm -hmm. was very frightened and I think she transmitted mm -hmm. this fear to me because um, mm -hmm. you know she didn't know what to do she was just overwhelmed yeah. and all of that and so yeah. there was some way that it felt like that hmm. I just felt like I discovered something about like what the that it's sort of like ignorant but it's also like in the service of something that yeah. I think is beautiful you know, poorly thought yeah. through but yeah that sort of it's it's happening right yeah and and i just i just love the kind of tender compassionate seeing of you know the grasping and i think before we can really banish or let go of something we have to like love it and have compassion for it even if it no longer serves us you know, so, and it is, it is beautiful, you know, as you've been expressing, it's like, yeah, groundlessness is scary. <laughs> like, it really is. And there is a lot of letting go. And it sounds like in your voice and in, you know, that you are being gentle and present with it. And that's, that's what it has to happen. No forcing. So, yeah. And I would say even if that arises more strongly to like hands on the belly, just come back to the breath and and titrate out and back. During the practice, I just taught yes. myself for a little bit. Just Perfect. Because I think that these practices have helped me to sort of approach these yeah. moments more tenderly. So yeah. it, just, it just felt like, you know, I think I had a sense about like, oh, these troublesome things are so, you know, ugh, get rid of them. Yeah. But I feel like I discovered something that was yeah. sort of sustaining. And, and, and all of us, our ancestral inheritance is our nervous system, right? <laughs> And so how do we, you know, gently and kindly and in whatever way you want to think about it, like heal it forward, right? So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So with that beautiful uh, reflection, let's just return to the breath again for a moment. And feeling the simple, beautiful potential of following an entire cycle of breath. And if it feels comfortable putting hands in front of the heart as a symbolic gesture of offering Bringing to mind this prayer of the Bodhisattva, this aspiration that we could be what is exactly needed of us, that our compassion could be like a lamp for those who need light, an island for those who need landfall, a place of rest for those who are weary and tired, for those who are sick, may we be their medicine. Dedicating this practice that each and every being, as long as space remains, may we too remain to help alleviate the suffering of this world. So each and every being can experience freedom, belonging, peace, and ease. So beautiful to be with you all.